and uh, welcome to the 30th and final meeting of 2017 of the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Relations Committee. I'd like to remind members and members of the public to turn off mobile phones. Uh, any members using electronic devices to access committee papers during the meeting should please ensure that they are switched to silent. Apologies have been received from Joan McAlpine, uh, the convener, uh, hence my uh, chairing of this morning's proceedings, and also from Tavish Scott. And I welcome Kate Forbes, who is here uh, as a substitute at this meeting for Joan McAlpine. So our first item of business today is a decision on taking agenda item four in private. Our members agreed. Thank you very much. That's much appreciated. Uh, our main item of business today is to take evidence on the Scottish Government's draft budget for 2018-19. We will hear later from the Cabinet Secretary, uh, but first I'd like to welcome our first panel from Creative Scotland, uh, and a, a warm welcome today to Jan Archer, the Chief Executive, and to Ian Munro, Deputy Chief Executive. And I believe, uh, Janet Archer, you wish to make an opening statement. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deputy Convener. Um, it's very good to be here today. Um, so I want to start by thanking the committee for inviting us to give evidence this morning. And as always, with such evidence sessions, we're here to represent not just Creative Scotland, but also the people and organisations working across culture and creativity in Scotland, to whom we've made 1,130 funding awards worth a total of 66.2 million over the past year. In terms of the draft budget announced by the Scottish Government last week, we're very, we welcome the increase in our grant in aid budget for 1819, including, importantly, an additional 6.6 .6 million to support regular funding. This commitment from the Scottish Government fills the gap left by the decline in income from the National Lottery and brings the amount of money available to us to support the next round of regular funding 2018 to 21 into line with current levels. And particularly worth noting from the draft budget is the Scottish Government's commitment to our budget for the next three years. And this will help us to provide more certainty for those that we're able to support. And it's been warmly welcomed by the cultural sector. And as such, I would like to formally thank the Cabinet Secretary, Fiona Hislop, Government officials, Creative Scotland staff and board, MSPs, including this committee and the cross-party group on culture and everyone in the culture sector. Everyone has worked hard to raise awareness of the cultural, social and economic value that creativity brings to all of our lives. And I'm in no doubt that this will be a significant factor in delivering a positive that this has been a significant factor in delivering a positive budget settlement for culture at a time when public finances overall continue to be under pressure. So as regards to regular funding, we, we currently support 118 regularly funded organisations with a combined total of 32.7 million through grant in aid supplemented with national lottery funding. And this includes organisations across Scotland, across art forms and across different scales. And that ranges from the Edinburgh International Festival, Celtic Connections, and Lanta and Storn away, Mareel in Shetland and the Beacon in Greenock, the Stove in Dumfries, Hospital Field in Arbroath and Peacock Arts in Aberdeen. We're mindful, however, that while our settlement from the Scottish Government's positive, demand for regular funding continues to be high. And we've received 184 eligible applications, and overall, those applicants requested a total amount of 153 million over a three year period. So we are now in the process of finalising our recommendations to our board, and we're going to set that against an impact analysis of each of our recommendations uh, and an equalities impact assessment. So Creative Scotland's board will meet on the 18th of January, and we will set the budget for 1819 at that point, and importantly, the board will make decisions in relation to regular funding. Uh, provisional date for the announcement uh, to applicants is on the 25th of January. So in terms of highlights from the annual review 1617, looking back, uh, we shared that with the committee, um, and we've now published that on our website. So in the last year, the last full year, regularly funded organizations delivered an 8% increase in the number of performances, festivals, exhibitions, projects, and events, reaching 
20% more people in more parts of the country, particularly in the 20% most deprived areas of Scotland. And with their work also supported jobs and skills development, as well, of course, uh, the local and the national in economy. And it's interesting to note that across the creative industries, there are 11,000 more jobs in Scotland now um, than there were a year ago. That's a tremendous uplift in relation to, to where the creative sectors now are. In the same year, we also made nearly 600 awards. We had the average £19,000 to creative individuals and organisations through our open project funding programme, rewarding almost 11.5 million at National Lottery and granting aid funding to projects across Scotland. And again, the increased funding available from the Scottish Government next year means that we'll be able to continue to allocate National Lottery funding to project funding. Um, and strategic funding. So this sits, the, the, our open project funding, uh, which is a, the, the project that funding that runs throughout the year, um, with, which sits alongside the 436 awards we've made through targeted funding, which is time-limited funding for a strategic, specific purpose, amounting to more than £22.7 million for key initiatives, including our support for SCREEN, for the Youth Music Initiative and for Cashback for Creativity. And we work really closely with young people through our creative learning work, developing current and future opportunities, and that's particularly important to us in the run-up to 2018. So we've got 12 separate funds for young people in 2018, and we recently announced the Year of Young People Traineeships, the Nurturing Talent Fund, and our really exciting Our Shared World project, which will bring young people together from across the world to voice their views in relation to what they want their world to be. So another key part of our budget for 1819 is an additional £10 million, which will be invested in the screen, which will double our annual screen budget to £20 million. And this is going to help us further build on the record level of film and TV production that we're seeing in Scotland at the moment. So £70 million spend in 2016. That's up 200% over the last decade and 30% in the last year alone. So much to build on. So this proves that Scotland's talent, crews, facilities and award winning locations continue to be a huge huge attraction to film and TV productions, including in the past year, Trainspotting 2, Outlander, The Wife and Outlaw King, which has just finished shooting. And Outlaw King has been, um, th its overall budget is 120 million US dollars, so significant in relation to what it's achieved. So that growth is going to be accelerated by the new screen unit, which Creative Scotland, um, the proposals of which were signed off by the Cabinet Secretary and published last week. The collaborative proposal has been developed by Creative Scotland and Screen Unit Partners, which includes Scottish Enterprise, Highlands and Islands Enterprise, Skills Development Scotland and the Scottish Funding Council, as well as input from people and organisations working in the screen sector. And I'd like to particularly thank the Screen Sector Leadership Group with John McCormick as their chair for their invaluable input into the process. So combining the expertise of creative skills and enterprise partners, the screen unit proposal sets out a shared vision and sets out ambitious targets for the Scottish screen sector. And we've now begun the work to implement the plans and ambition set out in the proposal. Um, so in conclusion, creativity really does matter to Scotland. So this year's figures show us that 90% of Scotland's population think that public funding for culture and creativity is a good thing, that the arts and creative industry contribute did 4.6 billion to the Scottish GVA, and, and that's up from 3.7 billion last year, and it supports almost 86,000 jobs, and we know that 90% of the population takes part in regular cultural activity. So culture has a, a huge role to play in the successful future of our country. It's fantastic that this is recognised by the Scottish Government in the draft budget. It's a budget that recognises the talent, energy and ambition of our creative sectors and clearly positions culture as a vital part of the fa fa fabric of our society. So I look forward to this morning's discussion. Thank you very much, and I know colleagues will have questions on a range of issues. Perhaps we can start with the uh, screen unit and the proposals for that. Clearly, uh, we came to Creative Scotland a couple of weeks ago, at least a number of members of the committee were able to attend on that occasion, but not really to get the kind of detail that perhaps we'd hoped for. I wonder if you would just uh, like to say a little bit about that. Uh, meeting that we had two weeks ago at Creative Scotland. Yes, well, first of all, I'm, I'm very pleased that we're able to speak openly about the contents of the proposal uh, in this forum. Um, 
and I'm sorry we weren't able to discuss the detail of that when we met at Creative Scotland. Um, you have all now, I think, seen the screen proposal um, and will have a sense of its vision. It's founded on a partnership between agencies, um, but it's a partnership between agencies and government and the sector um, critically working together. So the way that we're setting it up um, is to have a governance structure that sits within Creative Scotland that will bring in industry expertise, our partners, and Creative Scotland's board members um, who will um, hold um, responsibility for ensuring that the outcomes that are set in the screen unit are, are delivered. Since had the opportunity, the, 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 the detail, I wonder if you could perhaps just explain the, the reasons for the, the uh, difficulties two weeks ago. Was there a delay in the completion of the proposal or uh, was there another reason why you were not? No, it to? was just an administrative reality that the, the proposal, um, the, uh, the letter um, which approved the screen unit um, proposal had not arrived with us um, on that date. Um, and rather than try to adjust um, in order to be able to accommodate that, um, we just had to be straightforward and honest with you. Um, there was no issue in terms of the time frame. We presented it to the Cabinet Secretary uh, in, on the 7th of November, um, and after that date, we obviously wanted to take feedback into account in relation to um, producing the final um, blueprint proposal. Um, in order to do that, we needed to work with our partners, of which there are many, uh, and we, we, we needed to go through that process to produce the final proposal before we published it. So um, that's, that's all that we were doing in that, in that, in that window um, in relation to, to time. But there, was no, there were no issues. The partners are all very positive in relation to their contribution. We've met uh, as a project board um, over the course of that period, um, and I'm very excited about the new way that we're working with agency partners, um, which I think stands us in good stead for collaborative working in the future. Yeah, excellent. Uh, you, you mentioned the, the, the letter had been a, a, an issue. Whose letter was that to be uh, the letter that wasn't, wasn't able to go uh, at the time? The letter wasn't an issue. Um, we were expecting it. Um, mm -hmm. It was... It was clearly inappropriate for us to talk about the detail of the proposal before it was in the public, public domain. Um, so we did publish it um, immediately after we received the letter, um, and it's been welcomed very positively by the screen industry. Thank you. Can you tell me a little bit about the, uh, how you anticipate the additional funding uh, being spent, how much of that will go towards the actual creation of the unit, and how much is... Uh, uh, additional funding uh, around some of the creative uh, yeah. initiatives there. So, um, the broadly 20 million, uh, which is our screen budget, uh, we'll see 12 million invested in different types of content development and production, 3.85 million will support audiences and exhibition, a million will go into skills and talent development, 2 million will go into business development infrastructure, um, and um, we estimate that there'll be a, around a million uh, in relation, extra investment in relation to staffing, um, and some of that is about um, supporting the new data hub, which is a critical part of, 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 of this new project. Um, so set up um, happens from now, um, in fact, from a few weeks ago, um, into uh, getting us to the start date on April 1st, and we're building the cost of that into this year's budgets. Clearly, this year is this coming year is a critical year for the establishment of the unit and for taking that forward. What do you anticipate as the future funding requirements, and 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 how much of this funding um, for the coming financial year uh, will will meet uh, needs that will continue beyond that, and how much will be recurrent? Yeah, so obviously, we're, we're, our budget plan, the screen unit proposal, is predicated on outcomes which are set over a five-year period, uh, where building that into our budget plans going forwards um, and we will need to look at how the screen unit is resourced in the future once we've started to um, ascertain um, exactly what our needs are um, and once the screen unit is, is set up. Um, but we, we clearly have um, set high targets over a five-year period um, and the screen unit will need to be continued to be resourced over that period, as indeed all, all of our other work um, 
needs to be continued to be resourced over that period in order to in order to deliver. But until we actually start generating um, specific um, outcomes uh, and we can measure um, what the input needs to be in order to generate those in a in a in a really founded sense, um, I think we shouldn't at this stage make assumptions in relation to future future needs. Thank you very much. Can, can I, uh, Kate Forbes. Very much. Just a specific question on um, Gaelic, Scots, and traditional arts. I noticed that uh, last year you were able to um, give awards amounting to almost a million pounds to, um, particularly to, to Gaelic. In terms of looking to the year ahead, would you be expecting to be able to give similar levels of awards to uh, Gaelic, Scots, and traditional arts? Yes. So our um, all of our awards are based on applications. Um, so what we award is subject to the applications that we receive. Uh, we're really pleased with the increase in, in, in awards for Gallic, particularly um, over the past period, um, and we would hope that we would continue to receive applications um, over, over the course of the next year. Uh, we have a Gallic language plan. Um, we have an increasing number of Gallic speakers in the organisation, um, and I think we're genuinely starting to embed Gallic in a much more meaningful way across everything that we do, um, including Screen, in fact, uh, where we've supported Bannon um, with MG Alaba uh, in, a, in a really proactive way. So it's a really important part of our work. Great. Thanks, Kate. Uh, Rachel Hamilton. Uh, good morning, Janet. Um, I wanted to ask you a few specific questions wearing um, one of the clerk's glasses, so um, bear with me. Uh, <laughs> um, I just wanted to ask you about the um, funding, the capital funding that will be um, allocated, the 1.8 million for um, the uh, Rural Development Fund, which is going to go towards promoting the south of Scotland. Um, I just wondered if you had any more information about, um, uh, you know, who would be responsible for spending um, this this capital funding and and um, when it was likely to kick off. Um, capital funding through Creative Scotland or capital funding? I would be through his, actually through the major events budget for Historic Environment Scotland. Okay. So, is that more? Um, is that really more to ask the cabinet secretary? Uh, yeah. I would, okay, that's or fine. Heritage that's fine. Scotland. Okay, we'll um, move on to the my second question, which was about the local authority funding, um, and obviously you clearly get a lot more applications um, for funding than than you're able to allocate. Um, so for, to award that is, I just wondered if you could uh, talk uh, us through the process of how you 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 um, allocate those awards. Okay. Would you like to take that in? I'm happy to. Good morning, everyone. Um, we have a range of programmes that we run, uh, different funding routes, but in broad sense, um, there is a, a kind of model process which means that we receive the applications. Um, we have set timescales that we, uh, we publish. We have criteria that we publish. And what the specialist officers and teams within Creative Scotland do um, is apply their expertise to the assessment of those individual proposals. We know what budget allocation is um, as we move throughout the year, and we make sure that we, uh, particularly through the Open Project Fund, which is a rolling programme, are able to uh, manage that budget throughout the year to ensure that, that there are ongoing opportunities for people. So those specialist assessments then move into a panel, which is a different um, set of uh, expertise, um, combined staff, and this year we've also been uh, working with a pool of external specialists um, who've been sitting with staff to make decisions on those applications. Um, and then they're communicated out uh, uh, accordingly. We know that we have many more fantastic ideas and projects and, um, and so on from uh, artists and, and practitioners and organisations than we are able to fund. So the application of that expertise has to be open and transparent and it's captured in the assessment reports and that decision-making process which is available to any and every applicant. And we often engage in a very positive, constructive way on the outcome where there is an unsuccessful application um, with the individual applicant in order to give them positive feedback to help them consider how they might strengthen any future proposals, but recognising, of course, that there's never enough money and, and financial resource to support everything that we might want to. On that point, there's obviously um, a huge um, creative sector in Scotland uh, um, that's bursting to, um, you know, receive funding to, to kick off their ideas. Um, I just wondered, do you 
um, allocate within your budget um, an amount of money that you talked about to actually support those people to get to that stage? So we, we've got good data collection and analysis and, and we're increasingly trying to make sure that we share that visibly so that people can see that in a transparent way, uh, principally through our, our website and we pun, publish um, monthly grants listings. Um, but what we do recognise is that there are parts of Scotland, there are, there are particular communities and indeed, indeed individuals who um, would um, um, welcome uh, a more engaged dialogue with Creative Scotland in order to help support them to build capacity to make confident applications. And I think it's, also, it's always a, a, a kind of tension between the, the capacity that we have um, versus the demand that exists to, to respond to that. But we absolutely are proactively uh, ensuring that we're across Scotland, our staff are out and about, um, across Scotland, engaging with people in dialogue, trying to support them to talk about their ideas, um, explain what the opportunities are and, and how they can make a, an application to Scotland. So we monitor that um, through the data that we get in the, in the applications that we receive and the awards that we make uh, to understand where we might need to make some very specific um, targeted interventions. And an example of that would be in a geographic sense where we, we have a very kind of proactive um, analysis of where the geography of, of applications and, and spend is um, uh, through the open streams of funding that we have. But where we see there may be uh, particular needs, we have, for example, a, a, a partnership called the Place Partnerships, which is with the local authority and individual uh, principal organisations in that area to try and uh, build capacity to enable them to make um, future funding applications. And we've got um, 12 of those active across the country at the moment, many of them in the, the constituencies of, of the uh, committee members today. And just to follow on, I think it's important to recognise that Creative Scotland funding isn't, we're not the only player in the game. So there, there are many other funders. Local authorities are a key part of, of, of Scotland's cultural landscape. Um, regular funding where we invest 33 million generates 109 million through other sources that includes other public funding but also private funding and trust funding um, and our role is to understand how best to utilize our money um, not just in and of itself but also to leverage and unlock partnerships so that collectively we can create the best conditions for the creative sectors in Scotland to thrive. I think that, um, I mean, one of the examples in um, the borders is Gala Shields, where two and a half million of that funding will go towards the uh, tapestry and the rest will be provided by the local authority. Um, of course, there is a, a benefit there from a social and an economic point of view. Um, however, uh, much of uh, uh, many of my constituents are uh, split by, you know, with the, with the budget cuts within the local authorities as to whether this is a good idea now to take this forward. But, of course, these things are, uh, are, are, are arranged way in advance um, and you, you can't necessarily predict what's going to happen in the future in terms of uh, cuts. Anyway, just lastly, if that's OK, um, I just wondered if you could um, g give me an overview of what uh, the... Your, your partners within the sectoral development, um, their responsibilities are, for example, Arts and Business Scotland and Creative Carbon Scotland, Cultural Enterprise Office, Cultural Republic and the Federation of Scottish Theatres. Um, we, we haven't heard anything from those groups within the committee and I just wondered if you'd be able to um, give us an overview of what they do, considering that they do support um, making financial decisions. So they're all very different. Um, so uh, I would say... Um, we, if you go through that list, um, you, the Federation of Scottish Theatres is a membership organisation uh, for theatre and dance um, and um, provides support um, and, uh, for, for, for that particular sector, so it's very specific. Creative Carbon Scotland um, is effectively the organisation uh, that works with us to encourage more consideration in relation to carbon footprint, so we work with... Um, with Creative Carbon Scotland in a, in a very strategic way um, to uh, ensure that all of the organisations that we fund take environmental concerns into account. Um, Culture Republic is an audience development um, agency um, which um, is, was set up for that purpose uh, and applied to us for funding um, to, to be able to deliver a service. Um, Arts and Business um, provides a range of support for the broader creative sectors um, and exists to unlock 
um, private sector investment uh, and provide training and development for um, in individuals and organisations to be able to drive that. Um, and um, now I'm going to have to remember the last one. Uh, did you say Cultural Republic? Yes. Done that one. Um, Arts and Business Scotland, you've done that one. Creative Commons, you've done that one. Cultural Enterprise Office. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> and Cultural Enterprise Office was set up um, through, um, in fact, an identification by Scottish Enterprise that uh, the, the, the sort of business services that the cultural sectors require are different to the services that Scottish Enterprise would provide in relation to driving high growth. Um, and so Cultural Enterprise Office was set up in order to be able to provide that, that service. Okay, just, just one quick one. How, how, are, those, how are these organisations scrutinised? We have a funding relationship with um, all of our organisations. We, we would have a, um, a, w the ability to be able to sit on uh, as advisors on board meetings. Uh, we have a one-to-one -one, uh, relationship through relationship management, um, so an office is allocated to, to those organisations, uh, and we conduct annual reviews um, where we'll formally sit down um, and um, ask organisations to account for the work that they do. We also require organisations to complete an annual statistical survey uh, where we gather data uh, relating to the outcomes that they've set for themselves and measure whether or not they're successful or not in achieving those. Thank you very much. A couple of supplementaries to Rachel Hamilton's line of questioning. First of all, from Stuart McMillan. Good convener, very good morning. Um, you mentioned a few moments ago just in terms of some of the, the, the localities. And are there any parts of the country where uh, you feel as if uh, you could be doing with uh, more applications or there could be more output in terms of the in terms of performances and cultural activity. So in the annual review submission that, uh, that we've now published and, and has been sent to the committee, you'll see the latest analysis within section three of that, which is around place. Um, and that gives you uh, a sense, local authority by local authority, of the numbers of applications and the, the numbers of uh, awards that are made. Um, what you'll be able to identify is that there are um, in that list, um, some local authorities, and if you track it over a number of years, where um, we, we do need to be, uh, continue to be proactive to build that capacity that I mentioned earlier on, and that's, that's my reference to the place partnerships, um, which are absolutely about targeting those areas, those local authority areas, where uh, we recognise there's, there's a need to work more proactively with them. Um, there are... Um, ongoing uh, uh, review and analysis of, of that data. I think um, at this point in time, there are um, some local authority areas, particularly around the larger cities, which um, we're, we're proactive with, um, but particularly also those in, in rural and remote areas in the north of Scotland and indeed in the south of Scotland, where we, we need to continue to be proactively engaged to keep building that capacity, open up that dialogue more fulsomely in order to generate the ideas. Um, it's not just about the, the number of applications, which in some instances is quite low, it's about the quality of those submissions, because in a competitive environment of the, uh, the, the kind that you can see in the statistics where we're funding roughly one in three applications, we want to make sure that we get those high quality ambition uh, uh, ideas coming through too, so we, we're proactively engaged in, in that on a kind of more local level. And I would add to that that w I, mean, I would have observed when I joined the organisation that we're building on historic practice of investing in the central belt, um, and you, if you see, you'll see when, when you look at our budgets that um, a significant amount of our funding goes into, into Glasgow and Edinburgh um, in order to reach out uh, we, we've got two choices. We can either find new forms of funding to be able to really extend what we do, which we know there's a demand for, um, or we can disrupt um, and change the way we fund, which obviously doesn't, doesn't go down well in terms of the really important organisations that have been built up uh, in, 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 in the central belt. So we've got a real conundrum to deal with. Um, we've rebalanced and extended reach um, a wee bit over the past three, four years, um, and we're committed to continuing to do that. But 
the reality is, if we're really going to unlock the full potential of Scotland's creative endeavour, we're going to have to find a way of injecting new resources in order to be able to do that. The, re the rewards are great. We've seen the increase in terms of GBA. We've seen the increase in terms of jobs. We've seen towns, particularly across Scotland, who have been re rejuvenated and, re and, and with, through, through creative um, and cultural endeavour. Um, you only got to walk um, along the high street um, of, of, of places like Aberfeldy, uh, where you can see um, almost every other commercial enterprise on the high street is, is, relates to some form of, of, of creativity in one way or another. Um, but if we're really going to be serious about that, we're going to have to find a way of unlocking new investment um, and it, in all of its forms uh, in order to be able to really um, generate the step change that uh, I think Scotland could achieve. And, and you know, I honestly think that the, 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 we've got the talent base, we've got the ideas, um, we've got the ambition. Um, we just need to find a way of really um, giving life to all of that uh, in, a, in, a, in a really dynamic way. Thank you very much. Jackson Carlo. Yes, you actually uh, mentioned, in fact, uh, you made reference a moment ago to the, uh, the areas of members of the committee. Uh, I noticed, therefore, that the second least successful area in Scotland is Richard Lockheads, and the third least successful area is my own. So <laughs> we, 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 the committee aren't doing terribly well on that basis. Uh, what I want to be assured of, because I have obviously representations from disappointed groups, is that this local authority spread is an outcome and not a design. Uh, because, I mean, obviously in the way it's presented, uh, uh, the, the, there is an implication or there is an inference that can be drawn by some that there is a quota at play and that there is an, a design in terms of an assessment of the relative merits of particular areas as to what might be a desired outcome. Uh, and so I would want you know, to be assured and for others to understand that this table is an outcome and certainly was not a design in terms of the assessment of the uh, awards that were actually being placed. And also that I wouldn't, if I was to look back over other years, um, identify a parallel. Uh, we can give you absolute assurance that it's not by design. Um, uh, there are two sides to this. One is the application that comes in um, as driven by the applicants from individual local areas, and that goes into a competitive process in the round. But our analysis of that enables us to make proactive decisions um, around that when we understand that analysis. But the other side of it is the, uh, the work that we do proactively when we recognise these things, like place partnerships, where we're absolutely going in in a very targeted way with human and financial resource in that local area in order to have a dialogue, open up the ideas, explain what the opportunities and, and options are, and unlock those partnerships in that local sense that help generate confidence and capacity in, in, a, in a local area that overall will drive it up. So it's a combination of what comes in naturally into a competitive process and understanding our understanding of that analysis and then intervening in a way where we see there is an opportunity or a need to absolutely lift up the opportunities um, to those local communities. And it's worth also recognising recognising the, the work of the regular funded organisations. Um, they work right across the whole of Scotland and indeed internationally, but also those, those targeted programmes around Youth Music Initiative, for example, or Cashback for Creativity. Um, all these national programmes are very much um, um, looking at how uh, intervention across the geography of Scotland can be proactive, not just reactive in terms of what naturally comes from a local area. OK, thank you for that assurance. Thank you very much. Uh, Marie Gershon. Well, thank you very much. A few of the areas that I wanted to touch on today have already been covered by the previous, question, uh, previous questions that you've had, uh, because my, I, I was really just concerned about and really wanted to know a bit more about your working relationship with local authorities, because I do think that, uh, obviously, there's a pressure on everyone's budgets, and I think that the culture and arts can be a, an area of council budgets that, when it comes to it, and if decisions, hard decisions need to be made, that that can be an area which which sees the, which can bear the brunt of, of some of those cuts. Um, so really, just to hear a bit more about, you know, like I say, your working relationship with local authorities and uh, how you really work together in terms of what they're trying to do. I mean, I know that... A 
lot of councils look at other models now, uh, transferring a lot of their, their cultural organisations over to, to trusts, uh, rather than being directly managed by the council, but just be interested to hear a bit more about that. Working with local authorities in different ways, we have a, a team, a uh, place team, uh, whose remit is to work in, into all 32 local authority areas, um, and we'll monitor what we're, as Ian has said, it, w what we're delivering in each of those areas, um, and maintain a, a, a dashboard, if you like, of, of, of data uh, in order to be able to um, ensure that we, 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 we can invest wisely. We, I chair the Scotland's Creative Industries Partnership. Um, which includes representation from local authorities in, 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 in the mix. Um, and we will, we've been working with local authorities through the city deals. Um, we work with local authorities in terms of that they are, are um, partners in, in terms of investment into regularly funded organisations. And we also work strategically with local authorities through place working, um, which where, where we will work with a local authority um, and... Um, genuinely uh, identify local need. Um, I think our place partnership working is really interesting because it's a ground up process. So it's very much about us working with a local authority to um, identify what the strategic needs are from, from a community perspective uh, and then to um, allocate resource uh, in accordance with what communities uh, own ambitions are. Um, so we've got many different 12 13 different um, place partnerships um, where you can see um, that communities in different parts of Scotland have come together to be able to identify how they can deliver cultural endeavour in, in different ways. Um, I have relationships with chief executives um, in, in, in many local authorities, um, and so we've got an open line uh, if we want to have a discussion um, about how to um, find new opportunities to be able to embed um, creativity, uh, not just in terms of budgets, but also in terms of policy uh, into local authority work, and not just increasingly we're seeing a, a move not to see culture not just being seen as a, a box far away from everything else, but culture is something that's central, um, that provides cultural and social and economic value, and it's where it sits in policy, both in the cultural and leisure space, but increasingly in the education and health, um, economic development um, part, parts of local authorities in, in really tangible ways. Well, that leads nicely into the next point that I was going to raise, actually, and it's probably not a budget-related question, but it was really about the education element, too, because I know when we met a couple of weeks ago, unfortunately, we didn't get a chance to, to go into much of the detail in that, but in the session that we had afterwards, that's where I had some really interesting conversations with some of the other people that were that in the room that day, I, some young film producers, I, people from all sorts of backgrounds, and it was interesting hearing about the different routes that people had found into the careers that they now find themselves in. And it was really just to hear a bit more about uh, your work with education um, uh, because I think it's uh, especially with the, the plans for the new screen unit and obviously all the huge variety of roles that are available in, in film and screen and it's how we actually make people more aware of what all the full range of possibilities that there are there uh, and how we can start to filter that through in education if it's not happening already um, to really highlight that to people and show them what's available. Yes, so we work with Education Scotland um, and we have a, a, a partnership agreement. Um, we have a creative learning plan which um, has focused on, on uh, using creativity to generate um, skills to drive employability. Uh, we are, one of the things I'm interested in, anecdotally, I've had a lot of feedback that schools are starting to use the new attainment fund um, to deliver creative activity in order to increase attainment uh, in, in, in those schools that benefit from that. Um, I'm really interested in mapping that to see what the outcomes of that work have been, uh, because that gives us a good basis for what we should look at amplifying in, in, in the future. Uh, we have a creative learning team at, Scot at Creative Scotland um, who are involved, um, in fact, at a um, leadership level on a, on a global basis. Um, so um, we're involved in many networks drawing on learning and, 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 and good practice in other places, um, which we bring into the practice that we're delivering in Scotland. Um, so we welcome the Curriculum for Excellence in that 
um, the expressive arts are a really core component uh, of, 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 of what young people benefit from in Scotland. Um, what we want to do is to work with schools to be able to help skill up a wider workforce in terms of, of teacher practice in order to be able to deliver against that in a, in, in a proactive way. Um, so all of those things are part of our thinking in, in, in relation to the education space. Um, we know that um, engaging in creativity and, 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 and cultural practice opens um, curiosity, uh, it, it, it enables um, young people to be able to see beyond um, their, their, their life experience into uh, understanding what their wider opportunities might be, um, it increases confidence, um, there are many things that, 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 that well, as you all know, um, culture and creativity offer to, to young people and our, we, we see our job as being the broker that brings together creative practitioners and the wealth of talent that sits in, 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 in terms of filmmakers or in artists in Scotland with teachers and schools um, and, and I think it's really important that we do that. Oh, absolutely. I completely agree with you and I think that's where, like I say, it was just so interesting having those conversations and just, like I say, hearing about the different routes and how people manage to find themselves where they are now and, and I do hope that especially, well, like in rural authorities like mine that I think you know children need to be exposed to that and know the opportunities that are going to be available um, but just back to the budget as well you mentioned in your uh, I think it might have been your opening statement about the meeting that you have on the 18th of January uh, to finalise the decisions uh, about the regular funding um, are you able to give us any sort of idea though today of the what sort of percentage of the organisation organisations that apply for regular funding uh, will be successful in that or is that like say, decisions just to be made then? No. Um, they've, all of the applicants have applied for different amounts of money, so it would be wrong of us to give you a percentage at this stage. What we will be doing is taking our recommendations as they stand at the moment. They're going into analysis now. Analysis, that's... They're going into being evaluated now by um, our research team who are looking at them in the context of geography, um, in the context of art form, um, in the... In, 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 and we'll take all of that data um, into play in relation to making our final recommendations after Christmas, which will go into our board papers, um, which will be considered on the 18th of January. Um, it would be inappropriate to give you a percentage figure at this stage. Uh, what, was, what would that have been last year? Are you able to give us the, the figures for that? We had a greater volume of applications last year, a significantly greater volume of applications last year than we received this year. So uh, it was the difference was about 100 more last year um, than, than this year. It might be okay, useful to you. have those numbers in Not, the of course. So the analysis, uh, we're talking about um, this year and last year, we should talk about this round and last round, just to be absolutely clear, the last round was 2015-18, so um, it ends on the 31st of March. But um, the analysis of that is painted on the website. Um, but we'd be happy to provide a, a kind of further briefing on that if the committee would find it welcome. Uh, welcome that, we're happy to do that for you. Okay. Um, but you can see that analysis. But as Janet said, you know, we're going through due process at the moment and that will conclude in, in, in January. And there's no predetermined outcome on that. It's, uh, again, an application-based process with the application of, of specialist expertise and, and strategic uh, judgment applied to that to, to determine the final outcome. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much. Richard Lockhart. <clears throat> Thank you. In terms of your comments about trying to help different parts of Scotland build capacity so they can apply more and be more successful, hopefully, in light of uh, Jackson Carlaw's comments about certain local authorities, it, what does it actually mean in practice? I was looking at your, your table again, and of the £41 million that's gone to local authorities, £29 million roughly has gone to Glasgow and Edinburgh, which is quite a big chunk. And I expect the other 46 or 47 million, roughly, that's under others, i.e. not local authorities, I suspect quite a lot of that's going to Edinburgh and Glasgow as well. So what's your plans to address that? So uh, I think we recognise that there's, a, there's a, a kind of concentration, creative concentration in some of the major cities um, that, that lies behind some of that. 
but it does reinforce um, the need for us to understand the wider geography of Scotland to ensure that we have those opportunities um, clear and available. And that's where we're, we're proactive in terms of staff out and about in those local authority areas, engaging with the, the key partners, but also the individuals, because what you'll also see in the um, breakdown of the awards is that roughly a quarter of all funding uh, awards goes to individual artists um, and three quarters to organisations, although we should recognise that organisations too uh, support individual artists, of course. Um, but key to this, I think, is, is um, understanding that picture, but being proactive. We have limited staff capacity, as you might understand, so it's about how we can make our, inter our staff engagement and interventions as, as effective as possible, and that comes in a, a variety of different forms. But I think it's also about not just how we are able to go out, but actually how, how people from across the geography of Scotland feel like they can have a connection back into Creative Scotland. Um, some of that's online. Um, we have um, a, a great inquiry service that, that people engage with all of the time, as well as us being out and about um, engaging on an individual basis, but also taking part in different fora. So there are often funding forums that, that a, a range of funding partners get together to deliver in local areas. Um, but also these strategic funding interventions that we have, like uh, the place partnerships that we've mentioned a few times al already. So it comes through a range of, of mechanisms in a very practical sense. I, I, that's helpful. Just, I think the first time we took evidence from you um, as a new committee, this issue came up as well. So you're still seeing that there's still an issue to be addressed. So. It's forever. Is there any chance of we can maybe get more details in due course of how you can inject some urgency into that? Because some local authorities, of course, have scrapped their arts budgets, and some of the local authorities that have scrapped their arts budgets happen to be the ones in your table who are getting some of the lowest amount of money through Creative Scotland. So it's like a double whammy for those particular local authorities. Mm -hmm. So perhaps these areas are, are losing out compared to the rest of Scotland. And I just wonder, in terms of Edinburgh, there is an ongoing debate about Edinburgh benefiting greatly from arts and culture. Understandably, it's a capital and it's a, an amazing um, richness of, of culture and all the festivals. But there is a debate over the, the tourism tax. And have you given any thought to whether that be a good or bad thing in terms of a tourism tax, which would help take off some of the, the burden of national agencies having to fund arts and culture in Edinburgh? Before we answer the tourism tax, can I, um, can I just talk a wee bit more about the... Yeah the point that you're making. I think the local authority analysis is only one, is one lens to, to view things. I mean, I, I, I think we recognise that it's, it's forever a challenge to make sure that we are able to work across the geography of Scotland. Um, that's a you know, combination of, of factors, but including things like the local authority's own individual commitment to, to culture. It's not statutory. We've got a, a very strong creative learning network of, of um, local government officials across Scotland. Um, but it's patchy in terms of specialist cultural officers within local authorities, which um, makes it harder to engage at a local level sometimes. Um, but absolutely, that's why things like the Place Partnership um, approach, which is about not just engaging with local authorities, but actually the key um, active organisations and individuals in different areas um, comes to the fore because actually the energy is what we, we tap into and we work with and we build um, capacity around, including with uh, a kind of financial resource. Um, I think it's forever going to be a challenge to make sure that we're, we're um, able to respond to all of that and be as proactive as we can, but we do recognise absolutely that, um, that it is a challenge that we need to continue to meet. And we will be as proactive as we, uh, as we are, um, but we're working at a very local level as, as best we can, right across the geography of Scotland, beyond those cities. Um, but I, the tax question, tourism tax question, um, was the other part, I don't know if Janet, you want to I mean, I would just add something else in relation to reach, um, in, in, without defending the position in relation to investment <coughs> in the central belt. Um, which is historic and is based on many building-based organisations in many instances, uh, which provide um, really um, exciting programmes for people, the people of Scotland, but also people visiting Scotland um, who will often enter Scotland through the central belt. We know that tourism, for example, um, is now... Um, it, 
tourism in Scotland is it, about 33% of it, if, uh, if, you, if, you, if you look at Visit Scotland's figures, is now driven by cultural and heritage, um, which is quite an incredible figure. It's higher than the rest of the UK, um, and we need those anchor organisations to bring um, that tourism, tourism into play. Um, but the other point I'd make is that digital has transformed access to organisations in, in the central belt. And I think we're going to, to, to see, we've already started to see um, some of the work of organisations um, in, the, in the central belt be made available much more widely. Um, and a recent example of that isn't an organisation that we directly fund, but Scottish Ballet, um, their um, Right of Spring is now on the BBC's space platform um, and anybody can see it anywhere. Uh, and, and, and that's one way of, of ensuring that that, that that work is able to be enjoyed by, by people in different places. It's not the same as a live experience. I completely accept that. On the tax point, we welcome any initiative um, that can be brought into play in relation to tax. So clearly, the culture and creative sectors have benefited from tax credits on a UK level, which is, has, has made a real difference to people's budgets in terms of um, freeing up resource. Um, we are encouraging, and our chair, interim chair Ben Thompson has written to the Secretary of State, um, UK Secretary of State, um, in regard to lottery, in regard to encouraging um, freeing up the regulatory environment in terms of enabling um, Camelot, as the UK national, who, who runs the UK national lottery, uh, to be able to compete on equal terms in relation to the other commercial lotteries that have been set up um, recently. Um, it's not a level playing field at the moment, and 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 and. and um, and that creates challenges in terms of lottery income uh, all round for, for, UK, for UK lottery distributors, which include us. Um, there are examples in other countries of planning gain um, which enable cultural regeneration to be driven more rapidly in towns and cities. Um, we're really interested in that. Um, and of course, other tax initiatives um, come into play. Uh, the particular tax in terms of tourist tax um, is obviously contentious. Um, different people have different views. Um, and I think our view is that that needs to play out um, in, 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 and, and decisions need to be made in relation to whether or not that is something that the cultural sector in Scotland um, will be able to benefit from or not. Uh, Jackson Carlo. Just a, a, a quick uh, follow-up on, on the issue of place partnerships. Um, I see that there are there were 13 of them operating in 2016, 2017. I, I'd be interested to know how many of them were initiated in the course of that year, how many new place partnerships began last year. And how is a place partnership initiated? Uh, I mean, I, I can see from the structure around what it seeks to achieve that it is a mechanism which might assist but where does the initiative to establish, identify and progress a place partnership come from? Um, and as I say, of the 13, how many of them were new in the, in the most recent year? Uh, I'd need to go and check the, the answer to the question about how many were initi initiated in that year and we'll get that answer to you um, after the committee. In terms of how they are initiated, it comes in a variety of ways, but what we've sought to do is to, to now put structure around it, because as people have seen and recognised that they can be quite successful um, in being able to galvanise local uh, sense of energy and, and bring resource and, and so on around it to deliver change um, and, and strategic improvement. Um, what we're, what we're looking at is a kind of framework that enables um, it to be a combination of us understanding the picture from our data that, that we publish, but also where um, there is interest from across Scotland, those uh, individual local authorities making an approach to us or individual or individuals or organisations within those local authorities making an approach to us to open up the dialogue then um, to establish whether there is an opportunity for a, a place partnership or not. So, so but is, what's first, the chicken or the egg? Is, is it the local authority and people within a community coming to you or is it you looking to build something in a community? It comes both ways and, and it's varied over the course of those 13, the basis on which they've um, come to the fore. What we're seeking to do now is to, to make that structure of how it happens and how it comes about and, and which ones we then will, uh, on a time-limited basis, um, actively engage with through a place partnership to make that structure much clearer so that there's a, a process by which it, um, it can come to be. 
And I can now feel Gary Cameron, who leads our place work, um, who's probably watching this, um, wanting to, to, to come in. He is, is a new appointment. Um, he's come to us from Aberdeen Council. Um, he is stimulating a different way of thinking in terms of how we approach place partnership working. Um, and so we are, as, as Ian says, reviewing um, how we approach that. Our current place partnerships are mainly based on um, uh, historic um, working. So, so what we need to do now is take stock, uh, really understand what's work, what's worked, and what hasn't, and identify and, and 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 look at how we're going to move forward. So, we're entering into a period of strategy review, uh, as you would expect us to do. Our ten-year plan is now nearly four years old, um, and we're moving into the middle part of that. Um, so, we're, we're we're taking stock of all of the um, the um, outcomes that we've achieved over the past period uh, and looking at, at, at how we position ourselves into the future. One of the interesting things that Gary has done is he's brought all of the place partnerships together, um, which is the first time that we've done that. Um, and that was a very dynamic meeting. There was a lot of um, pan-local authority learning that came out of it. Um, and what we want to do, of course, is to um, record that and make that available more widely for local authorities to be able to utilise in terms of the lessons learned from this kind of ground-up um, community development um, through culture, um, which I think could be of value in a much broader forum. So um, Gary is, 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 is very proactive in wanting to make sure that we join up the dots across all of those place partnerships in a proactive way in the future. Thank you very much. Uh, Ross Greer. Thank you. Um, just to follow uh, Mary Goujon's point around uh, young people, the cultural sector has got quite a significant role next year in marking the Year of Young People in Scotland. I was wondering what the administration process has been for funding awarded to projects and events that are directly related to that year. Has it gone through the normal grant funding uh, processes or have there been separate streams to, uh, for the, the year's events? So it's a combination of both. Um, and we will, if you would like us to give you a more detailed report in relation to what we're doing um, in relation to Year of Young People, we can certainly do that. Um, but it ranges from um, uh, a, a project which um, effectively enables um, organisations to um, have a, a young person as part of their workforce um, for a year, uh, which we've just funded. I think we put about 80,000 into that. Um, in, 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 which will benefit um, young people and organisations in terms of refreshing their thinking um, to the project which is being led by um, a young woman uh, I don't think, uh, who is um, from Orkney um, called Amy Irvin and, and she's developing, this is really a, it's a sort of leadership programme so she is uh, tasked with developing a project uh, which will bring together young people from across the world. I'm mentoring her uh, directly in the framing of that um, and she's, she's just begun, she's been with us for just over a month um, and she's pulling together a partnership around that project. It's linked into the Culture Summit which is um, taking place um, in, in, in the Parliament next year um, and um, she will be sharing the stories of both young people from Scotland, um, but importantly, uh, young people from Scotland in dialogue with young people from across the world uh, in that forum. Probably be more than happy to follow that up once we receive the report. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Rachel, I think you had a quick question. A quick question, because I, I think um, the committee should um, really be addressing the, uh, the potential um, problem that the National Lottery fall in funding may have caused, and, and we received a number of letters, and so did the Scottish Government, the MSPs received letters of concern um, from culture bodies. Um, you also mentioned about the loophole where there's a distinction between um, betting and the National Lottery. Um, clearly, the additionality will um, fund projects that the Scottish Government currently can't. So we have um, perhaps, a no I have a number of questions. How do you feel that you can further strengthen the connection between the National Lottery and culture bodies and, and Creative Scotland in order to uh, absolutely define that there is a need for National Lottery funding and people are absolutely aware of that. Um, and secondly, I wondered what you might recommend um, if you were speaking in the future about the um, allaying the fears of, of the culture bodies when we're looking at an increase in the budget, which will potentially um, 
ameliorate the, the loss in natural, na national lottery funding moving forward. So, do you want to state that? Here? Yeah, so, uh, um, and Janet can, can add. Um, so two parts of your question. I think one of the things um, that we're very proactive um, with the other lottery distributors and Camelot, um, indeed, um, is the need to really paint the picture of what the National Lottery is supporting currently um, and make those connections in a very sort of visible, tangible way. So we have funding contracts that are bespoke to National Lottery funded activity that require the brand, the National Lottery brand alongside uh, Creative Scotland brand to be applied, but that only goes so far. So things like our, our um, annual review publication and so on, um, enable us to paint the picture using our website as well about making visible where National Lottery support is showing up. Because there's a very clear correlation in the analysis which uh, Camelot and the, uh, the, and the distributors are, are aware of between ticket sales and a kind of brand positivity where people see and, and associate at a very local level where they can see the benefits of National Lottery showing up. So it's really important that we're all proactive um, across the sector, not just Creative Scotland, but all those individuals and organisations that we support understand the source of funding, if it is National Lottery, or, or indeed grant and aid, um, that, that they're able to paint that picture for people. And we can elevate that through the channels that we've got. So I think that's a key, um, key aspect of it, and we need to keep working harder on that. I think the other, and it's connected to the second point, I think, again, it's work with Camelot, the distributors, um, including uh, DCMS and so on, about um, the level playing field that's needed for the National Lottery in marketing sense um, to ensure that the ticket sales, which drive the income um, and flows through to the good causes, are, uh, it, it is a, a level playing field, because at the moment it's not. Um, what we've got is a very clear sense of, of how the National Lottery is regulated in comparison to other society lotteries which are not so regulated. Um, and it's not such a, a level playing field. So I think, again, there's something about us working as distributors with Camelot um, and the DCMS to look at that regulatory framework um, alongside what it might do to unlock marketing budgets to then profile and lift up the work of the National Lottery in a positive sense to generate the ticket sales that flow back into the, the good causes of which we are one. Um, we get one point, so it's formula based, we get 1.78% of the overall National Lottery good cause um, expenditure. Um, I think the, just going back to the very start of the, the session, you know, the, the Scottish Government um, budget settlement is very welcome in helping to address that volatility. It's always been subject to ticket sales, of course, so it always fluctuates in terms of national lottery income, um, but it's been more volatile in, in recent years, which has led us to the position that we, that we see. Um, but there is very proactive work, as I say, across the distributor family to try and, with Camelot, to try and make sure that that's addressed. But it'll take time for that to flow through. In the meantime, the, the Scottish Government settlement has enabled us to get a more confident planning horizon um, over that three-year period, which is we, um, we recognise as absolutely exceptional in the current climate um, of, the, of public finance. Um, to give us that planning confidence on regular funding, but we'll continue to work hard with recipients and distributors in Camelot to, to make sure that that National Lottery picture is painted. Thank you very much. And uh, I'd like to thank Janet Archer and Ian Monroe for giving evidence this morning. I think we've uh, been able to uh, uh, consider quite a range of the issues in front of Creative Scotland, and we will hear shortly from the Cabinet Secretary. So we'll now suspend the meeting briefly uh, to allow a change of role witnesses. Thank you very much.
And we'll take evidence on the Scottish Government's draft budget from the Cabinet Secretary, Fiona Hislop, for Culture, Tourism and External Affairs. And I welcome uh, the Cabinet Secretary to the meeting, along with her officials, David Sears, the Head of Sponsorship and Funding Team, Cultural and Historic Environment Division, and Karen Watt, the Director of External Affairs. So welcome uh, to the committee. And Cabinet Secretary, I believe you would like to say a few uh, opening remarks. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Convener. Just a, a very short uh, opening statement. Um, I consider that the draft budget for 2018-19 to have delivered a, a very good outcome for the portfolio, uh, particularly for culture and external affairs. We've worked uh, hard over a number of months to deliver this, demonstrating the value of the portfolio's work and the benefits it delivers right across um, the priorities of the government. I'd like to just highlight a few uh, points from the draft budget. Uh, firstly, I was very pleased to be able to not only give Creative Scotland a, a positive outcome on its core grant and aid, um, that being a small increase to uh, cover staff pay awards, but I was also able to deliver an additional £6.6 .6 million to allow Creative Scotland to maintain its regular funding programme budget level so that Creative Scotland's decisions and funding are based on the merits of individual organisations rather than any serious restriction on resources available. I was also pleased to be able to deliver the programme for government commitment to invest a further £10 million for investment in screen, uh, bringing public spending to £20 million. And uh, finally, on the arts budget, um, as we go into the year of young people 2018, I was pleased to be able to protect the £9 million for the youth music initiative and meet the commitment to increase funding for Systema Scotland. Secondly, I've been able to expand the scope of our external affairs work with funding for additional staffing in Brussels and to develop a new hub in Paris, both of which will be particularly important as Brexit unfolds. We'll also enhance our presence in Canada and I've also managed to maintain the £10 million funding for international development and our new £1 million humanitarian aid fund, tackling poverty and inequality and providing immediate and effective assistance to disaster, disease and conflict in some of the world's poorest countries. Thirdly, uh, Historic Environment Scotland continues to draw in huge numbers of tourists and visitors and has forecast further growth in its income levels for 2018-19. This has allowed Historic Environment Scotland to reduce its reliance on Scottish Government funding, meaning I can deploy valuable resource elsewhere in the portfolio, while at the same time, Historic Environment Scotland will see a significant increase in its spending power from the increased income. And finally, uh, Visit Scotland will see its capital budget almost quadruple from £600 thousand pounds to 2.25 million pounds for investment in modernizing key visitor information centers developing partnership arrangements and improving digital and online information provision for investment in the scotland is now project which will see the building of a new joint digital infrastructure to act as a shop window for scotland combining the marketing activities of visit scotland scottish enterprise sdi and scottish government and so extend the reach and impact of existing operational marketing budgets so uh, I hope you agree this is a, a positive budget settlement for, for the portfolio, uh, particularly when at a time when public funding is under severe pressure. But I'm very happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. And we'll perhaps uh, approach it broadly, the questions broadly in the order in which you've approached the statement and, and, and start perhaps with, with questions on the cultural aspects uh, of your brief. I wonder, uh, you'll be aware, Cabinet Secretary, of the... A campaign, the a correspondence that members of this committee and um, no doubt yourself and others received um, from many organisations in the cultural field concerned about the prospect of a loss of funding uh, and clearly you've, uh, in, uh, as you've indicated, sought to address that. Given uh, the importance of that funding for those organisations and the steps you've taken this year, what uh, assurance can you give for future uh, years as to the way in which the government will approach uh, that, that core funding for, for key creative organisations? Well, I think the budget settlement is a strong statement uh, by the Scottish Government in our belief in culture uh, in the life of Scotland. Uh, the issues and concerns that have particularly been, uh, have arisen in recent times have been related to the changes in the uh, levels of lottery funding that Creative Scotland uh, have received and 40% uh, of their funding comes from lottery funding. Deregulation of the UK lottery has meant uh, has had an impact um, and we've seen reducing amounts which is affecting not just this portfolio but other areas like sport etc as well. Um, 
I contacted initially the UK government I think back in March. So this is not a new issue. This is something that we've been trying to address for some time to try and see if there was some way of um, mitigation from the UK government because of the decisions about the deregulation, etc. Um, there are, have been measures taken by the UK government and they've communicated to, to us what they may be, but there's no outcome as to whether that will you know, result in uh, increased income from the lottery. We're not responsible for the lottery. It's completely independent from, from the Scottish government, but it clearly has a major impact on the cultural life of Scotland. So therefore, in answer to your question, what are we doing to help um, going forward? Uh, it, it's the protection of the Creative Scotland's core budget for three years, provides stability for them in making their decisions. Uh, as they may explain, their regular funding um, uh, cycle which they're about to embark in is a three-year cycle, so that gives us stability um, for that area. And also in relation to lottery um, loss of income, uh, we've ad identified funding which I've managed to secure for this year, but also going forward for the next three years, should it be required to ensure that we can provide that stability. So the decisions that will be made by Creative Scotland about which organisations receive regular funding will purely be made on the merits of their application and the, 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 the artistic decisions that are made independently by Creative Scotland. So I've provided stability, and that's what I've tried to do right through the tenure of my position as minister, is because actually part of this is about having confidence in the sector. And what people say about Scotland is we have a confident cultural sector, and I want that to thrive. So uh, I think I've managed to provide that stability, should the budget, of course, proceed and be, um, be supported by members of parliament uh, when it comes to final decisions. An important part of, of that creativity is on the, uh, in the area of film and screen. And you've clearly made uh, taking the steps you've described around that. Can you indicate how much or, or to what extent funding for the screen unit is coming into the your budget from, for example, the enterprise agencies in order to support and sustain? Obviously, it's a collective Scottish Government budget that has provided the £10 million sure. additional that's going into um, the, uh, the screen unit. And that is currently sitting in the other arts uh, line of the budget, but that will be transferred to uh, Creative Scotland. Um, that is a, a major investment. I've you know, explained to the, the committee, I think, in my last appearance, that we would expect the, the blueprint to be ready by the end of the year, the, the, the end of the calendar year, which it is, and that's been uh, circulated. I circulated that to the committee. Um, and in relation to the operation of that, we expect that then to be up and running in time for um, the financial year so that we can start to spend the £10 million. But obviously there's been other funding, for example, the Production Growth Fund, the £1.75 million from last year, again, has been very successful, so that will be up and running. Uh, we expect, if you've read the, the screen blueprint, that um, other agencies will still carry out some of their functions. I think that's very important that the lead absolutely is, a, is with Creative Scotland and they'll be recruiting very high level and very impactful individuals who can you know, help drive this forward. But um, the, in relation, for example, to business development, Scottish Enterprise will still carry out some of the functions that they have in relation to how company development, um, Scottish development, um, uh, sorry, uh, Scottish skills, um, develop, skills development Scotland will still uh, provide funding in relation to their activities there. But the driver and in terms of the, you know, you've, you've seen the, the blueprint, that will be led from Creative Scotland. So um, 10 million is not, if you're asking me, is that the beyond end of the funding? No, it's not because we've still got the additional support that's been set out in the blueprint. Thanks very much. You'll, you'll be aware, Cabinet Secretary, or you, you may or may not, but we, uh, members of the committee uh, met with Creative Scotland two weeks ago to uh, address the issue of the blueprint. But uh, 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 it, was, it was not made available to us at the time. We perhaps expected it to be two weeks ago today. And so uh, we, we, we did ask Creative Scotland this morning uh, for the reasons for that, and they said that they were not in a position to publish that document two weeks ago, which was uh, surprising at the time. Uh, and they explained the partnership process they'd followed in developing the document, but it appeared that the, uh, uh, the committee was not included in that. A consultation at the last minute. Was there any reason for the delay in making that available? No, I, I met uh, with Creative Scotland on the 7th of November and we discussed the, the blueprint. I was broadly content, had some issues that had to be addressed, asked them to address that and return the blueprint for me to approve. Um, I finally received, I think, the blueprint to approve probably must have been, um, I think, the Wednesday evening before your... Uh, before your uh, I think your visit to Creative Scotland. I was at the uh, 
UK government, uh, China government, people to people event on the Thursday. I think I wrote to you on the Friday, having received it on the Wednesday evening, uh, approved the final blueprint, sent it to the committee as I had agreed to do um, previously to your predecessor on the Friday, and I think it was published for general uh, awareness on the Monday. Uh, so, you know, the blueprint is there, it's been well received. The Scottish Screen Leadership Group, which I think you've taken evidence from, um, have also been consulted to ensure that they, it met their requirements. And I think it's in a very good place, and we now have the funding should the budget be approved to be able to make sure that we can then recruit and ensure that we can take this very exciting next stage in screen development forward. Okay, thank you very much. Can I now ask Mary Gushon? Uh, thank you. I'd just like to go on. You mentioned in your opening statement about historic environment Scotland and how we had a really successful year with more visitors and additional income. Um, and it was really just to see about that additional income the Historic Environment Scotland have received. Now, is that something that remains with them or is that used more broadly across the, the portfolio? Uh, the Historic Environment Scotland obviously look after the uh, properties and care on behalf of Scottish ministers. And every year when we're agreeing what their budget will be, we'll discuss with them what their, you know, what their requirements are, what their spend is, what their income is likely to be, and to make an agreement with them as to how much of that income can be retained for reinvestment back into the historic environment and how much can be released to the portfolio so that we can then help support the wider portfolio interests and indeed a wider government interest if that's required. Um, in relation to what that means this year, it means that there will be, uh, in, in terms of a, an increase in their expenditure, they will have an increase in their uh, income available to spend. They need to be able to spend more because they have more visitors. More visitors obviously means that they have to have more provision, uh, so basic facilities, etc. Uh, so you know we're in a very comfortable place with Historic Environment Scotland. Um, they're uh, comfortable with the uh, resource they have available to them. It's an increased spend than they've had previously. And also, very importantly, and something that they very much appreciate, um, for the first time ever last year, I managed to achieve a capital uh, investment of for them of £5.6 million. That's actually increased. So I managed to not only maintain that for a second year, but also increase that. Because I think it's really important that we reinvest back in our historic environment. It's a, you know, uh, the, We have big challenges, uh, whether it's climate change or indeed other areas that uh, footfall as well can have have an impact. So reinvesting in our estate is very, very important. And I'm very pleased with the, the work of Historic Environment Scotland in, in, in that regard. Thank you. Well, just further to that then, I mean, have there been any discussions with them about how the, I suppose more specifically, they could use those funds to improve uh, visitor experience in, in terms of uh, increasing and improving accessibility to some of the visitor attractions uh, as well, and in terms of addressing the arrears in building repairs? Uh, absolutely. Um, accessibility is something that, you know, we all want to, to see uh, improve for all our facilities, but of course castles, and particularly some of the very historic castles we have, it's, it's very challenging in what can be done, but they're very conscious of, of trying to make improvements where they can. They've uh, carried out a very comprehensive um, asset management exercise, which I've been very impressed with, and they, they will release that at the appropriate time. Um, they are looking at how they can systematically work through uh, the the, the, uh, the the repairs and the, the requirements that they have. Uh, a lot of it is accessibility is also how can you use new technologies to help people understand. So, for example, when I visited Calavric um, Castle back in the summer, some really interesting work they're going to be doing there, uh, using digital work to help enhance that facility. Again, part of our commitment to, to the south of Scotland in particular. But again, that helps enhance the experience and also for families to, to help people get in the habit of um, visiting when they're you know, with, with, with young family members and realising that there actually are um, things that young people can do, enjoy, but also uh, be able to use digital as well. So they really are cutting edge in so many different ways, whether it's in digital, whether it's in conservation. Um, I think we should be very proud of the work that they do and I'm very pleased with the, the investments they have and I'm delighted that you can help them uh, reinvest back into it. So there's always going to be challenges and, and what property is, is dealt with when etc but we have to rely on their judgment. But the other important 
part is we're also investing in the skills for this. So uh, our investment as a government uh, was, uh, there was a, a period where we had 30 modern apprentices uh, in, in uh, traditional building skills, really important to, to make sure we've got the skill base. And also you'll know that the engine shed has been open this year. I'm not sure if the committee's had a visit to the engine shed in Stirling, but I would strongly recommend if you could, because it is very much um, uh, an investment in supporting an understanding and awareness of the importance of traditional building skills for Scotland. Very good education educational resource, but also it works with the, the sector, whether it's with the architecture sector, but also with um, the building trades themselves. Um, so it's a very good uh, example of our you know, investment in skills and in the historic environment sector. And I'm delighted it, it opened this year, but if you haven't been, I would strongly recommend you do. Absolutely. That was going to, actually going to be my next point because that was something we raised with Historic Environment Scotland when they came to the committee was about the whole uh, the traditional skills uh, and what was being done there. Um, have Heritage Environment Scotland, have they raised any concerns with you about potential deductions from the Heritage Lottery Fund? I mean, I know that is something uh, my hometown in particular, Brecon, has been a, a, a big ben beneficiary of that fund in particular, and it has had a, a big impact in you know, lots of other places across Scotland. Um, but have you had those discussions with them? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, unlike Creative Scotland, Creative Scotland um, Historic Environment Scotland don't administer lottery funding, but obviously within the heritage sector, um, there's complementarity, and quite often you'll see different projects come to fruition because they have a package of investments. Some of it comes from Historic Environment Scotland or Her Heritage Lottery, etc. Um, the although there, there's, there's Heritage Lottery Scotland to deal with um, funding less than five million, I understand. Um, and the majority, the large scale investment is on a UK wide basis. They too obviously have concerns about the impact of reduced lottery income to, to their effects. It's slightly different from Creative Scotland in that, um, as you will have heard, uh, the lottery funding for Creative Scotland tends to be for uh, individuals and organisations and people delivering, whereas a lot of the Heritage Lottery Fund is for ca actual capital works and they can obviously schedule them. Um, I understand that Heritage Lottery Fund um, UK have made a publication themselves about what they expect from, from lottery and they're actually downgrading their funding for 1819 down from I think £300 million to about £190 million for 1819. Um, and they're going to, because they anticipate the reduction could have an impact going forward. What they don't want to obviously, I, I would imagine, do is to have to claw back grants that they've already made, so they're having to make readjustments, so there'll be almost like a pause while they realign. Now, that will have an impact because that means that there's less capital there for very important works such as the Brecon and other places. Um, so that will, have a, that will have an impact, but we obviously try and work um, and align with uh, not just Historic Environment Scotland's investment, but also Her Heritage Lottery Fund. We can't, again, they're independent, we can't direct them in any shape or form, but some of the, the, some of the successes we've had in the past is when we've been able to <laughs> coalesce or co align funding from government, from Historic Environment Scotland and Heritage Lottery. So I, if you have an interest in that, I can't speak for Heritage Lottery Funds, so the committee may want to contact them directly themselves. Thank you <coughs> very much. Ross Greer. Thank you. Um, Cabinet Secretary, just to go back to the screen sector for a moment, obviously the bread and butter of that industry um, in Scotland is domestic, but as Janet Archer mentioned in the previous session, there's a significant role for international big budget projects, like what well, King was, was listed as a, a good recent example. In answer to a written question that I lodged um, recently, it was entirely <coughs> unclear if the Scottish Government's North American office played any role in supporting uh, the industry. I mean, given the geographical nature of that international industry, there's obviously um, you would expect a high level of interest in Scotland from being able to attract investment from America. Would you be able to clarify what role the Washington DC office plays in supporting the screen sector? Um, well, for example, when I've visited uh, the US in the past, uh, uh, the North American office supported me when I was in uh, Hollywood and I met with Lionsgate and Warner Brothers and we were discussing specifically issues around investment at that time. I think it was the King Arthur film in particular I discussed with Warner. So, you know, the, the and indeed SDI, remember there's also the aspect of inward investment. So some of the, some of those areas are, are SDI, SDI have an interest in as well. So that's a very practical example of how that's happened in the past. I should say that um, the written answer was not from yourself. Um, that's part of my confusion. I was expecting the answer to that to come from yourself, and I, I knew that there would be more useful examples there. But turn to the. Well, maybe I should have answered the question. Oh, my God. Yeah, no, I'm not saying, I don't think it was, it was not your fault at all, is what I'm trying to clarify. Um, 
Turning to the, the year of young people, would you be able to explain a little bit how the, the budget for that is being allocated? Obviously, for us to be able to effectively scrutinise it, it, it's somewhat challenging because naturally it's distributed across a number of streams. Would you be able to outline that a little bit? I think, I, th I, th I think it's very important that everybody contributes to the year of young people. It's not just seen by one minister or one, one portfolio. Obviously, in terms of um, the themed years, I've had responsibility across all the themed years this year being the year of history, heritage, archaeology. And there's always budgets that are um, available for events related to um, the Year of Young People. So um, the overall uh, budget is about 3.4 million. We, ha uh, we had a debate, obviously, in the Parliament just the other day. Um, a lot of that will be f about events, will be run by uh, major events that would, would help support that. But also there'll be students, um, uh, particularly in relation to um, community activity and there's a lot of volunteer like, very important work that I think particularly uh, is what young people want to get engaged with with the themes that they are engaged with on equalities and on, on and some of the issues that are involved there I think what might be helpful um, to the committee I'm quite happy to, to, to do this I think it'll be helpful for the rest of um, Parliament as well is to try and maybe bring together all that in one place so that you can people can see what's being spent where um, from the different portfolios but I, would, I wouldn't I wouldn't just limit your thinking to think, oh, well, it's got to be a budget line in the, the Scottish Government budget for it to be spent. So I know in my own portfolio, there's a lot of work happening with our national galleries, our collections, um, National Theatre of Scotland. So although it wouldn't appear as a necessarily in a budget line saying year of young people, everybody's been gearing up to this. So the actual impact of spend should be you know, really quite critical. But I do think that um, for the purposes of understanding uh, what's there. I'll work with Marie Todd as the, the, the lead uh, minister um, for the Year of Young People, but whether we can give a better understanding of what you know, what, what is being spent where, but it's being well resourced, well uh, supported right across government and in different portfolios. And I'm quite keen to, right through the year, um, show how different portfolios are contributing, whether it's justice, whether it's health, you know, because if this year is to be as impactful as we want it to be, um, this has got to be something that's just changing how we do things and making it mainstream that young people have got a central role, uh, but also uh, we raise the profile of what they're doing. So I think <coughs> this is a, I'll find a useful way, maybe if we can talk to your clerk as to what would be the best way of doing that, and maybe with the Education and Young People Committee as well, because how we best might present that to, to, to both those committees, but to MSPs more widely. I think that would be very welcome. Um, just to, to drill down to one specific area that's not for the year young people, but very timely, um, on the, the Youth Experience Fund, evidence that we'd taken as a, a committee previously, which I, I raised with you the last time you were here uh, around that fund, it's very welcome, but the evidence from the sector seemed to be that they felt directing it towards secondary schools may prove more beneficial than primary because they didn't have as much of a challenge attracting primary schools into their, their venues. Have has the government done any further work on that, had any further discussion with the sector? Well, I listened to what you said and, and also to the evidence that has been provided. Um, I'm going to consider how we best uh, you know, carry that, that, that uh, fund out. I, I think during the experience of the Year of Young People, we'll have a better idea about what works and what has impact. And also, if, I'm, if I hope... Um, uh, well, what I hope will be that some of the things that come forward as part of the year young people may end up being mainstreamed as regular activity by different organisations about how they help facilitate access by young people to different experiences. So I think it's worth um, taking stock about where we stand during the year of young people to see what has an impact and then ensuring that the Youth Experience Fund has maximum uh, you know, leverage. So it's not just displacing something, it's actually adding value uh, to new experience. And I think the key issue, though, when it comes back time and time again, it's transport. You can, you know, there's a lot of um, opportunities for young people and a lot of free ticketing um, and subsidised ticketing and all the rest of it. But the big issue, to, if we're really going to tackle some of the issues as to why young pe some young people can access culture or indeed other um, experiences rather than other things, a lot of it can, can come down to transport. So I think finding an innovative way to try and tackle that, to me, it would be one of the, the, the legacies from this, if we can. Thank you. Um, one more uh, question on culture from Rachel Hamilton. Yeah, um, morning, um, morning, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the draft budget mentions um, the culture strategy. Um, I just wondered um, if you were going to allocate any additional resources to take this forward and when it might be published and how it came about. 
Uh, well, the culture strategy is something that's um, developed over some time where people realise that, you know, as a country, it'd be very helpful if we had a statement as to the importance of culture, what it means right across the area. Uh, Creative Scotland does obviously some, some responsibility for some aspects and lead for culture. But, for example, our national performing companies or other, others are independent of, of, of that process. Uh, we've had a, a quite comprehensive uh, set of engagement. We've had, I mean, I've taken part in numerous, and we've had, I think, about nine, ten public sessions on the culture strategy, as well as uh, very bespoke um, uh, other uh, sessions where people are sharing their views. Uh, we've now come to an end of the the, uh, the, the, the first session of uh, engaging with people. We're now being to uh, you know, bring something forward that we can then consult on. Uh, I want this to be developed by and for Scotland. This is not you know, a government saying this is our view, of our state view of culture. That's not what it is. So therefore, the speed at which it is developed will be with the sector itself. I think with the statement that's come through from the budget, I think people will have more confidence as well that they can be planning for a stable future and be ambitious about what they want from culture. Um, in terms of resourcing budgeting, there isn't, a, there isn't a budget line that says culture strategy as if there's going to be some additional resource coming with the culture strategy. What it will do is enable what has been a very good settlement uh, for people then to identify, okay, what matters to Scotland in terms of prioritising? Is it young people? Is it access? Is it geography? Is it traditional? Is it modern? Is it you know, People can have a view as to what matters to them uh, and that can help shape and form the type of, of uh, you know, distribution that we can have in the future. But um, that's a, it's a collective a process, um, so I'm not predetermining it. I think it'd be wrong to predetermine it, but there isn't a, a sort of specific line that you can point to saying, "Oh, that will be that cultural strategy will somehow leverage an extra resource." What it might do, however, is if we can set it out in a very clear and comprehensive way and a clear steering strategic direction, it can help ensure that the contribution that culture makes for whether it's health, whether it's injustice, whether in other areas, um, you can see the benefit of that. Not all culture spend sits in my portfolio. So, for example. Cashback for creativity, which has had a big impact, is not something that you know, we benefit from, but it's something that's obviously coming out of the, the justice provision. Um, so I think that's part, one of the big things that we can get from the, the culture strategy is a clear articulation of how that, how the impact of culture reaches all areas, not just what would be the traditional sector of this portfolio responsibility. Okay. Do you want me to move on? Convener. OK, I'll, I'll ask my next question. Mm -hmm. um, so moving on to um, a question I have about, um, are you able to um, expand the detail of the rural infrastructure, um, the rural tourism infrastructure fund um, that is mentioned in the budget, please? To, to extent, yes, I'm delighted that we've got the, the resourcing and funding for, for that. Um, we uh, want to ensure that the facilities available is across Scotland, that we will identify, uh, working with partners, some of the kind of key areas that we'll need support. It will be for basic stuff, um, you know, parking, toilets, facilities to help pressured areas in particular. I've had recent, in fact, I just, re just uh, had recent correspondence from the leader of Highland Council about their interest and, and what that would be. Uh, and I've asked my officials to set up a, a scheme uh, in, in place so that we can move very swiftly to try and uh, deploy investment in that. Um, it's sitting there, um, some of the funding is in the major events line just now. I'll move that, I think, I think it's important that that's identified as tourism capital. We've not really had a tourism capital fund before, so uh, that's why it's maybe not as clear in the budget as it might be, and I'd like to see that maybe changed at a, a future re revision so that it would help the committee and indeed others identify where tourism capital funding um, is. A point um, uh, that the, um, the fund, that capital funding that you mentioned um, within that rural development fund, um, there is a uh, part of that for South Ayrshire Coastal Plan and um, a part for South of Scotland, I think it's 1.8 million. Um, who will you, is that part of the Rural Tourism Infrastructure Fund? No, okay. And, um, yeah, so the Rural Infrastructure Fund, yeah. which is the new fund to help with pressured areas, there's some funding, there's half a million pounds for South of Scotland in particular um, to help with tourism, which will be, some of it we're working with, as you'd expect, with local partners on that, so some of that will be around um, adventure tourism, forestry tourism, uh, digital international promotion, what we can do there. Um, and then there's also an element for Ayrshire, um, an Ayrshire coastal path, which will help um, the Ayrshires in particular. That's, again, working with local partners. That's what the councils have asked us to, to, to develop collectively with them. So that's additional to the funding that's available for the Rural Infrastructure Fund. OK, yeah. and last question. Do you have um, an idea of um, who will drive that uh, fund? 
Is it the local authorities who will be responsible for spending that money, the, the, the allocation of the Scottish Government money? It, we, we will certainly work in, uh, councils will be key partners in what we're doing, as will High and the South of Scotland in, in, rel in relation to the South of Scotland organisation. So, you know, this will be done in, in uh, coordination and agreement with them. And I, I would establish, I'm likely to establish a group uh, with key individuals to help us determine which projects actually can go ahead. But we'll certainly involve the councils in that as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have two other co uh, members with questions on tourism. Kate Forbes. Thank you much, and obviously I too um, welcome that commitment to move quickly on the Tourism Infrastructure um, Development Fund. But moving on to Visit Scotland in particular, I notice um, a very welcome uh, increase of 275% in the Visit Scotland capital budget to undertake maintenance and upgrades of visitor information centres. Could you sketch out a little bit more what the the, the priorities are for Visit Scotland in terms of capital, particularly in light of recent announcements to um, to close some centres and to move um, sort of in-house? Uh, well, obviously Visit Scotland can answer for themselves in, in relation to what their programme and priorities are. Uh, in relation to what we expect of them in terms of our, our, our guidances, we expect obviously the marketing promotion of Scotland um, in terms of some of the digital activity I, I outlined. The, there hasn't been a capital line really for, for tourism previously, so that's what I've identified in a number of the Rural Infrastructure Fund I've just described, the South of Scotland Fund, and also the Ayrshire's uh, Coastal Path, as well as, for the first time, this uh, funding that's available, particularly to help with them uh, with some of the delivery model in relation to how do we harness the marketing that actually does go on across a whole of different agencies more effectively and efficiently to, to get better value and uh, use existing uh, operational budgets. In relation to their, um, their, their own uh, deployment, they obviously need to refresh some of their uh, visitor information centres. Uh, there is an issue in relation to the 58% reduction in footfall. People aren't booking uh, using, I'm not saying they're not booking, but frankly, a, a big reduction in the number of people that are booking accommodation via Visit Scotland uh, premises. So that's obviously why they're carrying out a, a change way of operating. They need to rely more on a digital uh, platform for that to support what is, I think, somewhere between 1,400 and 1,600 um, uh, visitor information partnerships. So, for example, if you go to some, they'll be able to use, people will be able to access the information they would normally get from a Visit Scotland office from the Historic Environment. Scotland, uh, local locality, or other partners that are in that area, and they're quite um, they're quite extensive. And indeed, some of the response, if you look at the Look In, for example, where the local community actually wanted to take over what the provision. You might be more familiar with that was than necessarily myself, but they wanted to take over um, uh, what was being said and promoted in their local area, and so they've taken over that. But the information can still be. Be, be available. So, so the investment is actually to help some of the digital online kind of support under, that's underpinning that. It's, it's, that's quite impressive. And, and also in terms of developing that um, digital connectivity, um, obviously digital lies with um, your colleague, the Cabinet Secretary, for um, connectivity. How, what does it look like working with him in terms of rolling out digital across Scotland and particularly rural areas? and then assisting businesses to, in the tourism industry to be able to harness a uh, digital um, a, and, and, and develop. I no noticed that one of the priorities this year, for example, was developing an app, a tourism app for the A9 corridor. So mm -hmm. what, what do the priorities look for, like this coming year and how do you work with um, Fergus Ewing to, to develop that digital agenda? Well, digital is actually responsible to you. All, all ministers uh, are carrying out to some degree um, the Scottish Government's digital programme, and we have to. And I've also got responsibility for some of the inclusion issues. But the impact of digital is is, is considerable. Uh, you know, the fact that by the end of the end of um, 2017, we're going to have 95% uh, you know, rollout of fibre broadband. You know, is, is is very very important. The announcement this week: 600 million pounds for 30 megabytes is going to be really you know, that's a kind of a big development. What does that mean? It means more people can, can tr transact. Uh, and obviously, we're living in a world where, particularly if you look at the new markets, the millennials or you know those that are travelling, particularly to Scotland for adventure tourism. Scotland, you know, rough guide saying the most beautiful country in the world. A lot of people will be booking internationally and will be booking online. 
Now, unfortunately, to date, um, and a lot of it might be because of the, the either speeds or indeed accessibility, not as many people um, have been transacting uh, digitally as they should, they could and should be um, from from businesses. And so, what we we are doing is coordinating. And that's a program with Visit Scotland <laughs> and these Scottish enterprises, digital tourism. Ayrshire is going to be a, another a key focus for this activity, where there's a, an intensive period of uh, training and support for those companies. Th th those whether it's small hotels, bed and breakfasts, you name it, tourism businesses that aren't transacting online to encourage them and support them to transact online. And that should up the figures because I was quite shocked. I think I probably shared that to you, with you before, that in, in previous years, 60% of those that were advertising on Visit Scotland's websites weren't transacting digitally. That's now down to 50% and we're seeing a big change over the summer period where obviously that rollout has now meant that more people have got um, the access to the broadband to be able to do this. But they, obviously during the summer period, they're so busy, many of them running their businesses, that they've not necessarily been able to do as much of the training sessions. So we're working with Scottish Tourism Alliance and Visit Scotland to ensure over the kind of, I suppose, the quieter, you know, the, the quieter period, those training sessions are there to help people to be able to transact online. I've made digital, uh, I've got a high level um, tourism group where I've got the, the industry, um, Scottish Tourism Alliance there, as well as with Scotland, Scottish Enterprise High, and we will have the South of Scotland body. And I've made digital tourism one of the key things that we, we keep coming back to on that. So there's a journey to go on, but we're, we're well on that way to, to help deliver that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Richard Lockhart. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> Um, congratulations to the Cabinet Secretary on securing a good settlement for your portfolio. I'm sure it was very tough negotiations. Uh, but this would not be a meeting of this, meet this committee if we didn't discuss Brexit. Uh, therefore, I just wonder if you would like to comment on the implications for your budget of Brexit mm -hmm. and also refer to how fleet of foot you feel you might have to be moving forward. Okay. Um, I may, may bring in uh, Karen Watts as well on this issue. I, I thought we were going to get through this without discussing Brexit. Thank you very much for advising to, 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 to reach it. Um, I suppose you know a lot of it is the unknown, what we're dealing with, but in terms of uh, resources, uh, a couple of things. There's, some of it will be about the day-to-day -day issues, about how we as a government can deal with things and the resources that we have. So therefore, the, the overall government protection of the administration budget has been very important to make sure we've got resource and people and very skilled people to be able to deal with you know, the issues as they arise, and particularly in relation to um, the, whether it's the framework issues or uh, in relation to future trading issues as we go into the phase two. In terms of presence and um, capability and reach, uh, one of the things that the Cabinet Secretary for the Economy had announced was a, an expansion of the number of SDI uh, resource and staff in Europe. Uh, that's again not my portfolio, that's in his, but it's a signal of you know quite a long, far out identifying that we're going to have to have more intensive um, on, the, on, on the ground um, activity to support businesses in Europe. <coughs> We've um, established our Innovation Investment Hub in Dublin. Uh, uh, Brussels, were, this budget will allow, I think, four more members of staff in Brussels to help us support the resourcing there. Um, we will be opening the Berlin Hub. Uh, again, that will be helping our trade investment and also tourism. Germany is a major, a major um, uh, source of, of, of tourism and a very focus. And also this budget will support the Paris Hub as well. And that allows us to, to bring together and align more um, our government uh, deployment, whether it's in uh, trade and industry or whether it's in governmental or indeed in other areas. So we've, um, that, that's part of the explanation of the expansion of the external affairs line. So it's got different areas. Some of it is actually practically having people in place in capitals in Europe in particular, uh, and also in relation to the resource that is available, I suppose, domestically to help support that. I'd also um, indicate that uh, there's also funding in the budget to help um, the Canada development. Um, so we want to make sure that we're expanding in Canada as well, and a bit more resource there. Uh, international trade will become of increasing focus for, for, for the government and will need to be both in, I suppose, it's the practical um, delivery and support of those that are seeking more business, but also I think there's the, the operational, how do we prepare for Brexit? And perhaps, I don't know if there's anything, Karen, you want to add to that as well? Thank you, yes. I think the, the fundamental point is that having um, 
retained the resource element of the administration budget for the Scottish Government at 179.5 million, then I think that's the envelope that we're working within across government. And of course, it's not just this portfolio, it is every portfolio that's affected by, uh, by Brexit. <coughs> and I think our general approach, both in this portfolio and elsewhere, has been um, really to look at what assessments and preparations we can make for whatever outcome uh, we're facing. And I think that's part of the challenge in this portfolio and others in trying to work through how, how Brexit might be affected. Therefore, we're looking at a range of scenarios. So we're constantly reviewing where our resources are, whether we've got the right skills and uh, the requirements in place. And at this point in time, I think we've got the right level uh, within this portfolio of staffing and resources. We are uh, investing in our overseas offices and in our hubs to uh, have people on the ground. Um, and we're also being quite resourceful about bringing in experts. So we have people seconded in from, for example, Edinburgh University. We have the Standing Council of Experts, which the First Minister, the Cabinet Secretary and others can turn to. And we've got a raft of external stakeholders that we're working with. So it's a mixture, a mixed economy of people in post overseas domestically and with a raft of other external um, experts who are helping us look at the issues that we're facing. I was going to ask about Scotland House and how you envisage that role being resourced moving forward in Brexit. Um, you mentioned there's four extra staff, I think you said, going to be located in Scotland House. And meanwhile, it's been reported that during the transition period for Brexit that the UK will not be represented at the councils or taking decisions over, for instance, fish quotas, which means that the role of Scotland House and indeed domestic civil servants in the fishes section uh, will be influenced. I just wondered what the four staff were perhaps um, going to be focusing on. So um, the, there's additional resource for a resident director post. So we have now um, put a director into Brussels. Uh, we also have other uh, administrative but also policy experts who will be uh, in there. And I guess the overall objective is to be uh, making sure we're protecting Scotland's interest in the round, making sure Scotland's voice is heard, but also being more visible with key portfolios. Um, I, you mentioned fisheries. Uh, there are a range of justice, agriculture, other uh, portfolios. But by investing in the office... Uh, and also transforming it slightly into a, a hub that will bring together our uh, Scottish Government interests more generally. Um, we are aiming to be more influential both around the corridors in Brussels, but also to feed back more useful intelligence about what is happening uh, uh, on an ongoing basis. And as you know, Brussels uh, works through networks and through contacts, and by having a more senior presence and, uh, and an enhanced a staffing complement will be able to do more of that. Okay, thanks. Stuart McMahon. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, your letter of the 14th of December was uh, very helpful, I thought, and uh, there's a couple of questions just uh, regarding that as well. Um, in the letter, you discussed uh, um, it was discussed regarding the, um, the setting out the benefits of the single market, and uh, crucially the impact of choosing not to be in the single market. And uh, can you provide some information in terms of the analysis that the Scottish Government has undertaken now on the economic impact of Brexit? Well, we will be making uh, public uh, further analysis um, at some point in the new year, which I think will, will, will help the committee. I, and can I also just put on record my thanks to the committee? I think this committee has done a, a fantastic piece of work in terms of the, the various inquiries you've had in relation to Brexit. And I think you yourself have provided a very useful analysis that's helped the, the Parliament and indeed the country go forward. Obviously, some of the, 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 the letters I, the letter I referred to, I wrote to you, refers to the phrase around it, under um, forecasts of uh, a reduction of £11 billion a year by 2030 and 80,000 uh, fewer jobs uh, compared to remaining uh, a member of the EU. But I, I suppose when we are in a stage now where there's still um, a position where we don't know what the, the uh, state of Brexit will look like. Uh, we are very clear that single market membership, customs union membership, uh, is what we think would be the preferable. It will be the least worst option in relation to uh, the, 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 the negative impact of where we, of, of where we might be. Uh, but I think it's very important for us all to be vigilant, but also to set out, particularly in the, the areas that um, we have responsibility for, what that... Um, 
what that uh, what that would look like, whether it's in tourism, whether it's in creative industries. So you know, we've got to all be very vigilant on it. We have to make sure that in terms of setting out what the decisions and the options are, we are moving into a period. Um, where businesses will be making decisions if they haven't got certainty around this transition, particularly a steady state transition is desirable, or what the, the future state of the um, of, of the uh, the Brexit deal will be. There are still many many questions about that. Um, uh, I'm not necessarily in a position to forecast what that will be, but we have to make sure that we have we, we are well equipped to provide the country with analysis, and we will do that. But I, I can't release that information just now. It will be available to you in the new year. Okay. Thank you. Uh, your letter uh, also uh, highlights the, the issue of the EU funding up to 2020. Um, has the Scottish Government received uh, the appropriate clarifications from the UK Government yet in, in terms of the EU funding commitments contained in the joint report? I'm happy to be corrected, but we've, we've yet to see um, definitively what that you know, what that funding will be to substitute for all the different areas that we have concerns of in this portfolio. It's Creative, Creative Europe, for example, and others. It will be Horizon uh, 2020. I, I really sincerely hope that programmes like Erasmus, Horizon 2020, we can still continue in some shape or form to be members of. But for those areas, uh, and there are major ones, um, not my responsibility, but for obviously for the common agricultural policy, there's the, the subsidies that are available to our farmers there. There's, there's no indication as yet as to what and how um, the, the funding that can be provided are, unless there's other information that we have available. I would <coughs> simply add that <coughs> clearly the, the uh, Chancellor announced in the uh, UK budget that he was setting aside £3 billion for EU exit preparations, and I think there's discussion about how that is going to be spent and what it might mean for a range of uh, programmes and other activities. Yeah. Uh, and uh, my final question, uh, just as, uh, you mentioned earlier on regarding the, the hub in Berlin, do you have any indication as to uh, when that's anticipated to open? Um, we're um, at, I mean, the recruiting has finalised now and so we'll be making an announcement about the opening of that in very shortly. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, if there are no other questions from members, I'll finish with a relatively technical question. Oh, thank uh, you very much. That, well, <laughs> I'm, I'm sure you, I'm sure, I'm sure you have the expertise around you, uh, as well as, uh, uh, of course, at your own hand. Simply to refer to the consistent underspend in a number of recent years of the external affairs budget. It's been an underspend of only a million pounds or so a, a year, but nonetheless, it does raise the question of how confident you are that the adjusted figure for the mm -hmm. current year uh, will be fully spent and, uh, and also your projection going forward. As it, you know, it's, it's an area that the uh, committee has obviously had consistent interest on in various budgets. I mean, there is a kind of point that some of what we do in external affairs is reactive, uh, particularly for um, visits, whether it's incoming or outgoing, in terms of what can or should be spent. And also in the past, in relation to some of the humanitarian issues, um, as to whether spend is made or not, not made. Uh, what we've tried to do this year <coughs> and in our programme for government is uh, consolidate humanitarian aid. So there is actually is a fund and I think you've had Alistair Allen in fairly recently going through how that operates. Now that should I suppose provide a bit more predictability in relation to that. But you know, I think when, when resources are very tight, just because you have a budget, it doesn't necessarily mean you have to spend all of it just to spend it. It's really important that you only spend it what you need to. Uh, and I think, you know, some flexibility is required, particularly in something that is quite a react you know, particularly in external affairs is a bit more reactive perhaps than others. Most of my um, most of my budget in the portfolio um, goes out immediately in terms of grant and aid to visit Scotland, historic environment Scotland, etc. And you know it's it's uh, it's very much front facing, but some of it has to be a bit more flexible. But we know that you've you you keep a very close eye monitoring on that, and we'll, we'll, we'll make sure and keep you in touch. I'm sorry, I'm suffering here. <coughs> um, Sorry, sorry, convener. Um, I, I wasn't at the Christmas party last night. This is actual genuine illness. So, um, if there's anything more technical in that nature that you need us to respond to, happy to do so in correspondence. That's 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 very thoughtful. I'm disappointed neither of your officials is able to offer you cough sweets for the occasion, but I know it's been I know it's been a tradition oh. elsewhere. <laughs> Um, but but since 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 I, I landed you with a technical question, I'll, I'll ask one policy question just to just to finish um, uh, and and to give you a moment uh, as well. Um, and that was around the future trade negotiations, which clearly uh, will have a relevance 
uh, to many of the aspects of your budget and many of the things we've discussed today because of the, the crossover between culture, trade, external affairs and so on, and to ask simply if you've had any indication from the UK Government of what role uh, yourself and your colleagues will play in uh, putting forward those trade uh, well, negotiation positions. Well, well, clearly Michael Russell is the... Um, sure is the, the Minister responsible in leading on the Brexit negotiations. Uh, uh, and uh, we have had no indication as yet, I think, uh, as to what that might be the, the person that we normally have dialogue with in relation to uh, devolved administration, of course, was the uh, former First Secretary, Damien Green. And uh, we'll obviously have to reassess what the relationship will be with the Scottish Government and who will lead for the UK in relation to those uh, dialogues as we go forward. But there's nothing else I can add to that at this moment. Okay, thank you very much, and I uh, appreciate your uh, persistence in uh, getting through all of those questions and answers. Thank you very much to the Cabinet Secretary and to our officials. And our rest will be here. Thank you very much. And uh, we are about to move into private session, but may I, on behalf of the committee, do the same and wish the Cabinet Secretary, our officials, and all those here today uh, a fantastic break at Christmas and a good New Year. And may I also, as uh, Deputy Convener, at what may be my last meeting as Deputy Convener, uh, uh, thank the clerks, the, uh, all of my colleagues, uh, and all of the Parliament staff who have supported the work of this committee over the last 18 months, as well as, of course, the Government for uh, giving uh, so much evidence as required. Thank you.